I'm going to spend just a few minutes uh, telling you about the PCCA, and then I'm going to turn it over to John Mayo of Georgetown University for um, opening remarks. The PCCA has been around for 20 years now, and we were formed because the people at that time were convinced that there was some potential to this concept of wireless data. Little did we know that we'd become the forefront of computing and the internet technology and networking and, and so forth. So here we are today, a victim of our own success, uh, consuming more bandwidth uh, than networks are able to provide. So the mission of our organization is to evaluate wireless technologies and mobile communications architectures, promote wireless interoperability, uh, and what makes us unique is that we address the entire ecosystem. Uh, we're not just, you know, our membership comprises platform vendors, operators, modem vendors, companies uh, making infrastructure software, um, and so forth. So in our workshops, we look at emerging issues, emerging technologies, and consider the full scope of them. Um, we don't normally do policy, uh, but this is a unique opportunity to look at technology and policy at the same time. So I, I'm very excited about the day and we really have an incredible lineup of presenters and panelists, though I'm a little biased because I'm on the panel. So I do want to mention that uh, sometimes in our workshops we present very advanced technical information and so we have this warning saying that uh, these are considered public meetings, and we ask people not to disclose anything confidential. I don't think that'll be an issue today. For the workshop, uh, normally for our workshops, we do make all the uh, content available to our members, and then on a private um, web page. In this case, uh, we'll be working uh, with the school to make all the content available. So. Uh, don't feel like you have to take furious notes. Um, we will be, at least for all the presentations where there, is, where there are slides, we will be making those available for afterwards. And then we also provide um, contact information uh, so that you can follow up with people. We don't make the, um, we don't make the contact information public, however. I want to mention our future workshops. Uh, our next one will be in October, and it will be on machine-to-machine -machine communications, which nowadays most people refer to as the Internet of Things, uh, but not looking just at the uh, raw connectivity. We'll also be considering all the developments in cloud support and service level application programming interfaces. Basically, um, all the developments, and there are many of them, uh, to provide platforms to facilitate the development of M to M um, applications. Our view is that this area um, really is in its infancy, uh, but over time it is expected, and I fully believe this, after 20 years of uh, working in wireless technology, that the number of devices communicating over our wireless networks will exceed the number of people on the planet. Um, after all, even though there are many of us, the number of human beings is still relatively finite, and the number of objects that could communicate and will communicate um, is going to be a number greater than that. That, to me, seems absolutely inevitable. It's just a matter of how long it will take. Um, and the impact of that on our networks, um, I don't think we even um, have truly any idea, but I think the impact will be huge. Uh, the workshop that we're planning right now for Q1 of next year is on network virtualization, uh, as well as device virtualization. Um, network virtualization refers to implementing various network functions in the cloud, basically abstracting the functionality of the network um, so it can run on commodity servers. Uh, there's a lot of development in that. Uh, kind of some related buzzwords, buzzwords to that is software-defined network and network function virtualization. Um, that's another extremely important trend uh, for wireless technology. So that's what we're planning for the future. Um, and then, obviously, we'll be doing workshops after that, but we haven't finalized the content for those. So um, during the day, I do 
encourage people to um, ask questions for this to be fairly interactive. Um, John Mayo and I will take turns in introducing or uh, based on the type of presenter, we'll be introducing them separately and then I'll be moderating the Q&A. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to John. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming over to Georgetown. Uh, as Peter indicated, I'm John Mayo. I'm a professor of economics, business, and public policy here at Georgetown University in the McDonough School of Business. And I am the executive director of our co-host for today, the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. Uh, I am delighted and, uh, to be here and to have you here. Uh, I think we do, let me echo Peter's remarks and say I think we've got a great lineup for today. One of the things though that struck me when I uh, looked through the preparatory materials for today's conference was not the talent of the people that were going to be on the dais, but the talent of the people who aren't going to be on the dais. Uh, many of you could be and ought to be and certainly are at time, from time to time on the dais speaking. And so we're at an academic institution. So what I want to do is just simply encourage all of you to use this opportunity for a full and rich discussion and dialogue and debate. Uh, that's why we're doing this, not to, for people to be spoken to, but to engage in an honest discussion and, and debate and, and dialogue. Uh, to get uh, maybe not every answer to, uh, to policy questions and challenges, but to have a more informed and a clearer vision of those. So, so I do want to welcome you here. Uh, the other thing I'll note is that the title of this particular conference is called The Optimal Coevolution of Mobile Broadband Technology and Spectrum Policy. And when I thought about that title uh, and uh, the list of speakers that we have, it occurred to me that virtually every one of the speakers, I believe, will not speak about the past, the, what I think of as the, as the long history of the evolution of technology and policy, but instead will probably use this particular moment as an opportunity to say, where are we now and how might this be an inflection moment to alter or adjust either technology or policy or both to improve economic outcomes. So if you'll allow me the liberty of, of just in my brief remarks, going back, uh, and I'm going to do I'm going to do the history of of this industry in I hope about ten minutes, no more, uh, or five minutes even. Uh, but to just put uh, a little bit of a frame on what I hope will be a forward-looking discussion by other folks, so that we have the full the full richness of a of a discussion about the evolution of this industry. The word spectrum is prominent in the title, and so if you think about the, the beginning of spectrum, at least from the perspective of voice-to-voice of -voice communications wirelessly, it really occurred in the form about 100 years ago. We have to go back 100 years ago to ship-to-ship -ship and ship-to-shore radio communications. There's a little bit of a debate about where exactly that was. I saw a historical marker in Ohio claiming it was done there. There are other folks that believe it was done elsewhere. But what really mattered is that it was the first use of technologies, wireless technologies, that drew upon spectrum. And that, of course, morphed pretty quickly into uh, commercial uses, into, the, into radio, uh, commercial radio, and radio stations sprang up all over the country. And then to over-the-air broadcast television. Much later, to cellular telephony. And then again, more recently, to the issue of, to the industry of what we would refer to now as mobile broadband technology. Now, the technology evolved pretty quickly, but what happened for the vast majority of this period, for the vast majority of the last 100 years, is that, that spectrum was allocated, awarded to users based on government fiat. It was just simply decided by the federal government that government would allow you, whoever you was, to use spectrum based on government fiat, on 
whoever sat on the problem on the spectrum first, whoever asked first, whoever filled out the prettiest application, beauty contest, or whoever was even just lucky enough to win it at a lottery. Now, in hindsight anyway, it strikes many of us in this room, I think, as a grossly inefficient way to have done business. And it was sort of against that backdrop that in 1959 an economist at that time, a young economist named Ronald Coase, wrote an article in the Journal of Law and Economics that made what, in, again, in hindsight, seems like a rather obvious statement or, or case, but at the time was really radically thought of, thought of as a radical notion, that is that we might better advance the cause of allocating spectrum and advancing economic outcomes if we would create an institution that was more reliant on, mar on the market mechanism, on the set of on auctions, as a way of creating a, a vehicle for moving low-valued spectrum into high-valued uses, and thereby creating economic value. Took a while, but after a chorus of, of uh, economists over the next 40 years or so, kept singing the praises of these liberal open auctions in which people could come and bid on auction to use that, uh, on spectrum to use that auction, that spectrum in ways that advanced their cause to satisfy consumer demand. In the mid-1990s in the Clinton administration, policymakers got it. And we've, the long story short is that those auctions have by and large been remarkably successful in creating economic value. Uh, and we have, they have created tens of billions of dollars for, uh, of revenue for the Treasury. It has enabled the growth and, and proliferation of first cellular technology and now mobile broadband technology. Now, I told you it was going to be a Cliff Notes version, so let's go forward to 2007. In 2007, what happened? A little inflection moment. The inflection moment was, and it's a bit of a caricature, but something big happened, and that was the, the advent and the deployment of the iPhone. Thank you, Coleman. Uh, for the prop, <laughs> uh, the iPhone, and, and what the iPhone did was to begin to usher in an era in which consumers were able to transmit not only voice, but data and video as well, and that led to the burgeoning demand for spectrum. Now remember that the allocation of spectrum as an inefficient property wasn't really a big deal if there wasn't a burgeoning demand, but if there's a burgeoning demand, then it creates tension and pressure on the system in terms of prices, in terms of the ability to deliver stuff if you don't have adequate spectrum in the marketplace and can't use it. Now again, let's fast forward to the year 2010 when the Obama administration, the form of the uh, National Broadband Plan headed by, by Blair Levin, who's here today, took that challenge seriously and began to introduce a series of ideas into the discussion uh, of whether we might uh, move spectrum from the public sector to the private sector, and whether we might advance technological uh, efficiencies, whether we might do things to facilitate the flow of spectrum between private parties and so on. Those are the things that are at, in the debate today, in the discussion today, and to see how those are at play with each other is really the focus of this conference. So with that backdrop, we now are in a position to look forward. And to do that, uh, we have, as I said, a marvelous lineup of speakers. Our first speaker is Blair Levin, who, is, who has been a leading intellectual force in the evolution of telecommunications and, and, and spectrum policy in particular uh, for uh, some considerable time now. We're delighted to have him here. And what I, what I challenged Blair with was something that had been kicking around in my mind for a while now. I asked Blair to speak on, generally speaking, on the, on the title of the push and the pull of technology and consumer demand, opportunities and pitfalls. And the reason that I wanted him to do this, again, it's just been something that's been in my mind, I wanted to hear what Blair's thoughts were, is that if you think about, about technological advance from one perspective, it is that, that consumers demand new and better to tools, toys, applications, 
uh, ways for uh, satisfying their own individual needs. And it is that demand side that drives technological progress. And yet there are other instances, and Blair has a vision of these, in which technological progress might be driven more from the supply side or at least to interplay with the demand side. And, and in that capacity, Blair has been instrumental at gig.u in, in, in leading this effort. And so I think that particularly for an audience that involves technologists and policy people, uh, it would be particularly useful to have Blair speak on that. So please help me welcome Blair Levin. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, I, I didn't know that John uh, actually didn't want us to go through history. Uh, the first slide that I'll bring up actually uh, is the beginning of um, what I regard as the uh, age of network planning. But I can't do it until the slide is up. Um, I, I might also note that um, I, I actually am highly amused by the notion of myself as an intellectual um, force in the field, only in the sense that I attended recently an event at Stanford University uh, with all the game theorists talking about incentive auctions, and, and I probably understood about 10% of what they were saying. Um, but I also had the kind of bizarre thought that none of them would actually be in the room talking about this if it weren't for me. I'm kind of like this, I'm a political plumber, but uh, anyway. Um, oh, I have this. Let's see if this works. Yes, so this is the beginning of network planning. Um, this is from the seminal work on broadband coconuts where Groucho Marx tries to interest Chico in a property that connects to the mainland via a viaduct, and Chico famously responds, why a duck? Why a no coconut? Uh, why a no chicken? And I think of that often. Okay, the okay, movie actually wasn't about broadband, but in my work with gig.u, I get the question a lot, why gig? Why not 100 megs? Why not 50? Um, and it's a very legitimate question, and it goes exactly to what John is talking about. Do consumers lead the demand? Do the networks lead the demand? It's an even more legitimate question in a conference like this, which is on mobility which is where the current energy and frankly all the, the capital is now moving and yet the speeds are just a fraction of the kind of the speeds that we're trying to do with gig.u. So what I want to do today is review the current efforts to deploy a gig and talk about the evolution of the thinking about that in the kind of the push-pull that John was talking about and then end with a few thoughts about how they relate to mobility. So I'm going to do a little history first. Um, when we were working on the National Broadband Plan, we had the luxury of thinking about uh, what, was the great, what were the greatest risks to the broadband ecosystem two to ten years out? And one leaped out from the data, actually Peter's data, uh, as well as others, and, and that's uh, the lack of spectrum. So that's the agenda that frames today's program, and it really flowed from the questions and recommendations that the team laid out in the spectrum chapter of the plan, largely written by Ruth and John. Ruth will be here later uh, today. But the data also showed something interesting about wireline deployment which was that for the first time since the beginning of the commercial internet, there was no national provider with plans to build a better network than the currently best available network. Now, some one thing I learned on Wall Street was the easiest way to lose money is to think that if a line is going like this, it will always go like this. It doesn't. Uh, and so what we, what we saw, what we were wondering about was, w would the competitive forces drive network upgrades? I'm not saying there's no competition, I'm just saying the network upgrade cycle seemed to have ended. And that raised the concern that without a dynamic that would lead to a critical mass of communities not having just good uh, bandwidth but the best in the world, America would not grow the human capital that knows how to design, build, operate, and most important, innovate on top of the, those networks. And that would be a problem because those networks would be the birthplace of many of the next generation uh, products of, of economic leadership many fields, genomics, robotics, 4K television, big data, they're bandwidth hogs. And they're going to develop products we can't quite imagine. We don't know of the uh, products that consumers crave that require such speeds, but it's important to recognize consumers never ask for products they don't know about. Innovation actually comes from the unknown. 
you know, John was talking about history. Nobody in those early days, no consumer in 1910 or 20 asked for a radio. They didn't ask for a television. They certainly didn't ask for a personal computer. As Henry Ford noted, if he had asked consumers what they wanted, he, they would have said faster horses. Now, the, the other night, I, I don't think telerobotic pitching is a consumer product. Uh, but the other night in Kansas City, Google helped a kid, uh, a young boy with a rare um, blood disease, actually throw out the first pitch even though of the Kansas City Royal game, even though he was um, 1,800 miles away. It's a very moving thing. I don't think it's a consumer product. But the point is, it's very early in the game. We don't, uh, we don't know what those products are. But we do know that the economy is increasingly delivered over bandwidth. And we need communities where bandwidth is not a constraint to innovation. Future leadership requires not just market following networks, but a critical mass of market leading networks. Now, we held um, numerous discussions about how to deploy such networks. The most productive were with Google, which decided it would simply take on the challenge itself. And by the way, the answer we proposed in the plan was actually bad. Uh, it was not going to work, but fortunately, Google and others including number of gig.u communities have provided a better answer. So one answer to the why a gig is product innovation, product innovation. Another is business model innovation. We don't talk about wireline evolution with the same generation language we use with wireless, where 3G and 4G are common nomenclature. But we might think of it as a gig as creating a step function increase from 3G wireline broadband to NG, uh, end state wireline broadband. In the first three wireline generations, companies built and improved broadband functionality on networks originally designed for a different service, and therefore they faith bandwidth constraints. It's not surprising. Scarcity is built into the DNA of nearly every business from time immemorial. It makes sense for such networks to segment customers by bandwidth needs. But just as in other sectors that where supply tracks Moore's law, abundance in certain inputs opens doors to new models. And unlike in wireless, where we actually don't know the endpoint, but we envision incremental uh, wireless generations, we actually know the end state of what the wireline network will be. It's a fiber-based conduit with upgrades made possible not by new conduit, but by electronics at the edge of the network and advances in software. They provide a step function increase. They are future-proof. Their designs results in similar economics for a broad range of speeds. The incremental cost for delivering a bit is basically nil. It's not surprising then that the business model for such networks is fundamentally different with minimal customer segmentation and critically, critically, no data caps. It's part of their business model. So for the first generations of wireline networks, the challenge is, was how to efficiently allocate a scarce resource bandwidth among different customer segments. And for an end state network, the challenge is how to deploy such a network inexpensively enough to deliver abundance. And I, I don't think government policy should favor one over the other. Consumer choice should determine the winner. But as a matter of innovation policy, government should take steps to assure that some critical mass of communities have access to, and, uh, to abundant network uh, bandwidth networks. Because, and I've talked about this at other speeches, won't repeat it now, that creates both a business model innovation and a psychology of consumer abundance, which is critical to experimentation and innovation. They provide a fertile ground for that economy where the value creation is moving from the manipulation and distribution of atom-based products to information-based products based on abundant bits, chips, and bandwidth. So product and business innovations are two reasons for a gig. But even without innovation, a gig is pretty awesome. I just used it for the first time in Kansas City. It reminded me of the first time I grew up in Los Angeles. I drove a bunch of clunkers as a kid. Uh, and then one day, I, a friend of mine let me drive his brand new car. It was really cool. Yes, it did not avoid traffic jams. I couldn't fly over them. And I was subject and with great pain to only drive at the speed limit. But everything I did in the car felt better and more responsive than the old used car uh, I, I had driven. Uh, and that's the way it felt when I was using the network. And it made me understand what the great computer scientist John Kay uh, meant when he said that as to network speeds, the slowest speed we will tolerate is the fastest speed we have experienced. Performance matters. And gigs are not just good for wired performance. And this is often not understood, um, probably well understood in this audience, but not others. 
as, we will, as we've already heard, wireless data is accelerating so quickly, there's no way the FCC can free up enough spectrum for exclusive use to meet the demand. So cellular providers are increasingly have to use small cell short hop uh, offload, generally Wi-Fi, to meet the demand. And, and therefore, the deeper the fiber is in the network, the better the performance, both qualitatively and quantitatively, uh, the wireless performance is likely to be. A lot of um, announcements about this at the cable show and here in DC uh, this week. And so multi-network performance actually joins multi-type innovation as another reason. Google's entry demonstrated an additional kind of set of reasons. When it asked if any communities would like a gigabit network, 1,100 said yes. This is an astonishing reaction. And the question really is why? Now, my friend and former National Broadband Plan colleague, Scott Walston, who you'll hear from later today, recently wrote a paper in which he said the value of gigabit networks is not any of the reasons I've cited, but rather simply the competition that it brings. It's a very thought-provoking paper. You should all read it. Um, it's typical of Scott, very well done. He's no doubt correct that competition is a benefit of the Google and other efforts to deploy um, gigabit networks, and that it will require changes in local policies in order to get those networks. Indeed, the gig.u hypothesis has been that if communities lower the cost of deployment through changes largely in local regulation and improve the competitive opportunity, the curves will drive new deployment. And we've seen this theory work in action within hours of Google announcing the Austin network, AT&T announced it would do the same. We've seen similar reactions from Time Warner, CenturyLink, and others. Shouldn't surprise anyone, and it's not a criticism of incumbents to note that in every gig.u community that becomes active, incumbents engage in a more robust dialogue uh, about how to meet community broadband needs. I used to kid my friend Milo Medine, who runs the Google Fiber Project, that if the two of us simply released our travel schedules, we could cause an upgrade throughout the entire United States. Um, but more seriously, what we see in the communities where Google and gig.u have announced project is what we saw in every competition upgrade cycle. Incumbents become better companies, consumers benefit, innovation explodes, economy grows. Now, Scott argues, uh, interestingly, that the real disruptor of the Google approach is not actually the gig, but priced at 70 bucks a month, but the five megahertz offering, which is basically $300 connection fee and then free. Now, my bet's different, but that's why you run these tests. That's what we find out. Um, but he, it is a really good point about Google serving the low end of the market. He calls it competition. I call it business model innovation. But we both agree on the value of competition, even if I think he underestimates the long-term benefits of innovation and performance. But he's also missing something else that was noted by another broadband team member. It is a great alumni association. Carlos Kirshner, now a uh, analyst at Bernstein, who recently wrote, much of the discussion about the impact of Google's partnerships with the cities where it plans to deploy its fiber to the home network has been about their impact on costs and expenses. We think there are cost benefits uh, as Kansas City has adjusted rules. Uh, and these have a material impact on deployment costs. That said, we think such partnerships have a very important and often underappreciated by investors impact on the demand side. We think the high awareness and purchase intent for Google Fiber detected by our Kansas City survey was driven by community involvement. In other words, Wall Street un uh, underappreciates that Google has tapped into a reservoir of interest in the community for an improved broadband service, and it's the community involvement, something about which Wall Street has a blind spot, that drives, according to Carlos, a 77% interest in buying Google Fiber, a data point which Wall Street will intensely focus. Now, here's another underappreciated point, as Scott notes, Google did not have a build-out requirement. Instead, it set a target for each neighborhood. As a result, neighbors had to organize to get the gig. Only over 90% of the neighborhoods did so. But the organization, the community involvement, would not have occurred if there had been a build-out requirement. And this leads to something else that many people missed, and I, I actually missed when I started thinking about this earlier on. What we see in Kansas City and other places where we're doing gig.u is a virtuous cycle. Community efforts lead to better networks, and now this leads to a broader use of broadband, leading to higher adoption, which assists in creating a greater competitive dynamic, which itself leads to greater innovation. Each factor positively reinforcing all the others. I must say for my work in government, there are a few things that are better in life than starting off a 
uh, a virtuous cycle. Though that still doesn't answer the core question, why did these communities come together over broadband? Now the common thread that drove the 1100 communities to do so was they realized the economy is increasingly going to be delivered over bandwidth. They wanted to lead, not follow in that economic trend. They also understood that it, the upgrade would provide uh, externalities, benefits that are newer to the broader community that are not captured by the network provider and therefore don't fit in the investment calculus. To achieve these, a new um, social contract is necessary because today's primary networks, telco and cable, were not built to solve today's problems, transferring abundant bits at low cost. We have to recognize the obsolescence of the economics that drove their original deployment, the awarding of a monopoly in exchange for an agreement to provide universal service and other public goods. To deploy new or upgraded networks, the old framework won't work. Um, there's no monopoly to award. And so here's where we've arrived. There's a lot happening to what you might think of as the wired upgrade agenda, thanks to Google and a lot of community efforts, gig.u communities. The map of America when we were doing the broadband plan looked kind of like this. And today, in terms of not actual networks, but in terms of kind of communities that are very actively engaged in doing it, looks a lot more like this. The President of the United States, supported by a bipartisan commission that includes President Bush's Secretary of Education, is now advocating we must upgrade the bandwidth of our nation's classrooms to a gig. The Senate just passed Senator Leahy's amendment to have the government fi fund five gigabit test networks in rural America. And these and other efforts now underway support a common theme. America wants an upgrade. So let me close quickly with five lessons I believe are relevant to today's discussions. Number one, it's the upgrade, stupid. One can argue about the benefits of the gig, which ones are most important. But, and it's not, Scott's right about this, it's not about the gig per se, it's about the dynamic that drives and follows a step function increase. If that happens, then innovation, improved performance, competition, community involvement, all these good things happen and reinforce each other. Number two, market structures matter. Upgrades don't happen without a new element of competition. Market structure and market opening policies matter a lot. And I'm going to do a quick sidebar on mar wireless market structure. There's been a lot written recently about whether some companies should be excluded from the upcoming auction. This is exactly the wrong question. No company will be excluded. I guarantee it. The right question has been true of every auction, and I distinctly remember the internal FCC debate on the first dozen or so. Is there, is, should there be any limitation on a single buyer in an auction buying all the spectrum? For every major auction, the answer has been yes. Reasonable minds can differ. But the right debate is really about what that limit should be. And I look forward to getting past the false debate and moving on to the important one. Third lesson, wireless needs wireline. For no community, it is either or. For all communities, it is both. The greater the density, the more the need for wire to support wireless. Fortunately, density can also reduce the per customer cost of deploying fiber. Uh, number four, solve the policy problem at the right level of government. Uh, spectrum issues have to be solved at the national, issue, national level, but most deployment issues are better addressed at the local level. The federal government can play a constructive role in, in stimulating deployment upgrades. I won't go into that here, but anyone who's read previous speeches knows I'm not a fan of recent FCC efforts in this regard. To summarize my critique, um, I came, I saw, I issued a press release is not exactly a strategy for conquering. Um, still, we should understand where the real leverage is, and every mayor has multiple levers that even the most aggressive FCC chair would not. And five, don't discount, as we frankly often do, the leadership aspirations of the American people. They want to lead in the bandwidth delivered economy just as they led in the manufacturing delivered economy. A plan that delivers a scarcity of the fuel for the information-based economy is not good enough. We need a plan that delivers abundance. Look, in the effort to lead, I admit, concepts like aspirations, community involvement, and psychology abundance are difficult to measure and often difficult to see. But from my own experience the last couple of years, they actually are vitally important. And it reminds me of what Einstein once said, that everything that can be counted does not necessarily count, and everything that counts can't necessarily be counted. Thank you very much. And I, you want to do questions? Mike.
that's the third rail? It's, <laughs> it's not the high cost one? It, it, no. <laughs> if every urbanized home had 100 megabit or more yeah. service, why in the world would you need over the air television? Uh, and, oh, uh, and, that, you're right. That, the third rail is. And I, I know yeah. that when you were writing the broadband report, that was probably impossible to put in there. But now that you're not writing the broadband. No, it was report, not impossible to do that. It was taken out. It was taken out. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's if and when we ever we, got. We wrote it. If and when we ever got universal broadband, at least in urbanized areas, uh, how, and if we could find a way to get universal service that's affordable for everyone in that, for that broadband, uh, how could we transition to decreasing the amount of spectrum even more than the incentive auctions? Uh, yeah for non-broadcast TV uses? Um, I, I, have, um, I have been extremely reluctant to talk about internal discussions during the development of the broadband plan. The plan should speak for itself. My colleague, Carlos Kirshner, um, did write a piece, so I, I feel okay mentioning that we actually started with a different plan. And you know, I, I won't go into the complexity of it, but it would have, would have produced a lot more spectrum, but been politically much more difficult. Um, and there were a lot of advantages to that, in part because we thought it would kind of create the opportunity for much faster speeds mobile uh, right away. But, you know, the things, we'll, we'll see what happens with the incentive auction. I think the, the, the primary task today is to move forward with what Congress asked the FCC to do, do the incentive auction, and then see what happens again. And the next folks, it may produce a, a bunch of spectrum, it may not. I think it's, it's actually, uh, it's, it's difficult to predict. What is not difficult to predict is that increasingly um, the the notion of single channel broadcasting as a as the critical vehicle, which it was for many years in terms of delivering news information, et cetera, its importance just decreases. And I'm not making a philosophical judgment. I'm just talking about consumer behavior. Um, one of the kind of more amusing moments in the broadband plan was the day that the snow caused Washington to shut down, and the broadband team was the only team, I think, in official Washington that was working because we were working under a deadline. I'm sure there were others working, but um, a broadcaster, somewhat amusingly to me, noted, said, well, if the broadband team knew what the weather was, they have the broadcast medium to thank. And, and I have to say, of the 70 of us who showed up for work that day, I don't think any of us um, got our weather information from the broadcast medium. Most of us just got it from looking out the window, actually. But, uh, 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 you know, look, so I think there are other vehicles, there are other ways to do it. I look for, I, I am, I'm optimistic about the incentive auctions working. But uh, if it doesn't, then I think we have to re-examine that that third rail will continue to be. Yeah. Well, we do have that in most urban homes, right? We have cable can can do 100 megs. Well, that's also true. No, actually, it's not what it did. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, uh, yes, but I think of that as incremental in the sense that, well, first of all, remember in September of 2009, and I, I apologize for misunderstanding your question, in September of 2009, we, we, we very consciously put a slide out on the cost to the country of 100 megabits everywhere. And I, if I recall correctly, it was, it was in the 300 billion, I think 320, I can't remember what it was. But it was high enough to discourage certain rural interests from saying that's what we ought to be doing. And that's consciously why, why we, I mean, we, the numbers were what the numbers were, but that we made it public very early on because we did not want that to be um, uh, seen as what we're trying to do is have a universal service at 100 megs. Um, the universe, uh, your, your point is simply, if you have that kind of speed, you can get all your videos over the internet, so why do you need broadcast television? I don't think you need speeds that much for that question um, to be raised, but it's certainly it's a legitimate question. I would just say, you know, we kind of had that internal debate. Other 
folks. I, I wish we'd had a more robust debate about that during the National Broadband Plan, but various folks decided not to, so we move on. Yeah. Brian, I wondered if you have any reaction to the presidential memo being released this morning telling the government agencies to, to cooperate with the industry in trying to free up spectrum and, and looking at uh, rationalizing their spectrum and system requests. I think it's great. Uh, look, I, I assume Tom will talk more about it. Um, I, I'm, I'm totally delighted by it. I think that, um, you know, S Spectrum is the most important public asset for the um, uh, broadband ecosystem. And as I've said, the broadband ecosystem is going to deliver a huge amount of the economy. We have to look at it differently than we did before. Um, and I, I kind of think about uh, what, what's interesting, and John, you started by talking about how we have to not be in the past, we've got to be looking forward. My conversations early on about Spectrum with the broadcasters and a lot of government agencies resembled, the, the, the argument resembled the following. If it was good enough for the past, it's good enough for the future. And I would respond by saying, you know, if I was on Wall Street and said, I have a great investment thesis. I'm going to create a mutual fund that only invests in companies that were around in 1950. I wouldn't raise a dime, and I shouldn't raise a dime. But that argument is the same as that investment thesis, that the way we should invest our most important asset is the way we invested it 50 years ago. Or my math is wrong, more than 50 years ago. So I think that it's very important that the government take these steps. Um, I know Larry and others at NTAA have been trying and working on this problem for a while. Um, uh, I wish them the best of success. And I, I think it's great that the president uh, and, and the White House is taking, uh, taking this issue on. So, you know, I, I see that the auction process um, allows the, as 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 you're promoting it, as as the as it's being promoted rather, is an attempt to drive the supply side, mm -hmm. get get a lot of money invested in new licenses to do and, and new infrastructure, new long-term investment. Mm -hmm. But doesn't that run the risk? Because the people who are going to spend the money are the current economic incumbents, the Googles today. Five years ago, it would have been Microsoft. Fifteen years ago, it would have been IBM. Doesn't this risk locking in a snapshot of the current economic and technological incumbents in control of this infrastructure? Compared to what alternative? You know, John mentioned earlier, John mentioned some of the things we used to do, right? Well, I, I completely disagree with his characterization of lotteries as irrational since it was the single best investment I personally ever made. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. I was a young lawyer in North Carolina. I had a thousand extra bucks sitting around. That's all the extra money I had. It's very unfortunate. A friend of mine was doing one of these lotteries. Nine months later, sent me a check for 50000 You know, I mean, I'm very grateful for that new kitchen. And I thought, that's the stupidest government policy I've ever seen. I had little notion that years later I would help in getting rid of it. My point, my, my answer to you is, I think that, I, I think that there's, there's a risk to every policy. There is nothing as perfect, right? You can't know the future perfectly well. It is a much better way of doing it than alternatives. I think a bit of the safeguard is unlicensed. Actually, it's a very important safeguard for, you know, Wi-Fi has created all kinds of different innovations. Uh, so my answer to you is, I'm not, y yes. I mean, the, the thing about when you auction something, you are essentially rewarding those who have access to capital. But otherwise, you're rewarding stupid lawyers in North Carolina I, who happen I, to have an extra thousand bucks in there. I'm a, I'm a capitalist on a, a <laughs> relatively small scale. <laughs> the thing is, is that time scales don't seem to match to me because infrastructure is long term. Right. I mean, you're talking hundreds of years potentially. I, I, I would go the, for 30, but okay. But, you know, I mean, Historic. More, more than Wall Street's quarterly thinking. Right. Yeah. Whereas, whereas you know, capital, you're, you're taking a snapshot of right. the economy right. today at the moment right. of investment. Well, look, there are ways of dealing with it. And I think when I talk about the, the right question is, what are the limits? 
that was what drove a lot of thinking of different auctions. One, one auction, uh, one of the two big mistakes of the time I was at the FCC the first time was the C block auction, which was an attempt to solve the problem that you're talking about. That is to say, the C block, people remember, was an auction in 96 that only allowed entrepreneurs in. And uh, I, I won't go into why it was a mistake. It wasn't, it actually, I, I think it was a mistake for re reasons different than most people, but that's not important. My point is, it's actually very hard to provide, um, put your thumb on the scale to have entrepreneurs come in and, and not have problems afterwards. It's very difficult. Uh, having said that, there are certain things I think the FCC can and should do to incur, to kind of make sure that there's a competitive dynamic in the market, and, and I, I know the staff is thinking long and hard about that. And, and if we have the right debate, I think we'll get there. But I don't deny that problem. I just don't know a better alternative. But if you have one, please file something right away. I, I think we need to move on. OK. Thank you, Thank you all very much. I hope you enjoyed Blair's discussion as much as I did. It is always extraordinarily interesting and, uh, and uh, to listen to Blair and to, to think about the implications of what he has to say. Uh, our next speaker is Tom Power, uh, who is the Deputy Chief Technology Officer for Telecommunications in the Executive Office of the President. Uh, I've known Tom for a while now. Uh, again, not to, to beat the same drum too much, but uh, as I did with Blair, but Tom is also someone who is clear-eyed and, cl and plain-spoken and, and really offers a way for us to think about how we might smartly move forward with telecommunications policy. And as part of the administration, I know he has been in, influential in helping direct some very clear-eyed policies. So please help me welcome Tom Power. Thank you, uh, John, and uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you to Georgetown, and uh, thank you to Blair. It's always tough following Blair, because he's, he's uh, always a uh, good, provocative, intellectual thinker. Um, Blair and I have known each other for quite a while. Uh, we worked at the commission together back in the 90s when he was chief of staff to Chairman Hunt and I was working in uh, the bureaus, and um, and then uh, Bill Kennard replaced Reed, and and Bill hired me, and uh, as as we moved into the chairman's office, I you know reached out to a few people and to to get some advice on on uh, how I should be thinking about things from the from the perspective of the chairman's office, and Reed uh, Blair gave me uh, some of the best advice uh, I I ever got, and uh, I'd like to share it with you, but I've forgotten it. Uh, <laughs> Blair, do you remember what it was? Yeah, it was really, really good. Um, no, actually, I do remember. I, I don't remember the words, but I remember it was think big. It was, it was, uh, 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 you know, I was just thinking of it here, consistent with the themes that, that Blair was just saying uh, today. Uh, uh, you know, there are so many opportunities in front of us and many that we don't know. Uh, and as Blair was talking about with consumers who don't know that uh, they didn't ask for a radio or a personal computer. Uh, and uh, I know from my perspective, uh, you know, I take it very much of a, uh, as, as my obligation in the in the spectrum world to uh, to not not be too worried about what the exact new applications or services are going to be. Uh, our job is really to um, uh, make sure that the government is doing everything it can to support all the smart folks, the entrepreneurs, the innovators, the the private uh, sector folks uh, who can who can solve those problems uh, a lot better than we can. We just need to give them the tools. Um, uh, I, I am going to talk about uh, a little in a bit about a, a presidential memorandum that is uh, being issued today on Spectrum, which we're very excited about. Uh, I wanted to put it in a little bit of perspective. Um, you know, we're we're uh, it's it's so exciting and so cool to be able to work in this in this sector. Uh, even over the last few years, as the economy was struggling, uh, we've seen so much great uh, news on the economic front in the wireless sector in terms of uh, private investment uh, up. Uh, 40% between on an annual basis between 2009 and, and 2012, uh, estimated to be $35 billion this year, uh, close to $200 billion in uh, GDP contribution. Uh, most of the world's 4G subscribers live in this country. We are about 5% of the world's population, but we're most of the world's 4G subscribers. Uh, we 
dominate uh, the, the uh, market for smartphone operating systems. Uh, uh, mobile apps is an American industry. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the world's largest uh, maker of chips for devices, uh, uh, as I was just reminded uh, by Dean, uh, is a U.S. company. So uh, a lot of great success. Um, you know, we uh, uh, recognized early on, as did Blair and the team at the Broadband Plan, uh, that uh, fueling that growth is, uh, was, was imperative. And it was almost three years ago that the president issued uh, his first memorandum on spectrum, and that was uh, directing NTIA to work with the FCC to find 500 megahertz of spectrum that could be repurposed for, for mobile broadband and wireless broadband. Um, NTIA uh, took that ball and started running with it within a few months. Uh, it had identified uh, 115 megahertz of spectrum uh, uh, to uh, to put in the hands of the FCC and the commercial side. The FCC has uh, already released uh, an NPRM on uh, 100 megahertz of that, the 3.5 gigahertz band, and is seeking is taking public comment on that. They've also uh, announced their intent to auction uh, the other 15 at uh, 1695 uh, next year. Uh, following uh, following that, uh, the NTIA decided to look at the 1755 ban. This is the ban most sought after, I think it's fair to say, by industry. Um, there was initially uh, some uh, debate there, which goes on, frankly, uh, as to how much of that ban to look at. Um, the industry was and is very focused on the lower 25 megahertz of that, as, as many of you know. Um, it's, uh, it pairs with uh, other spectrum at 2155. It's internationally harmonized. Um, a lot of good reason to look at that. But NTA uh, wanted to look at uh, what from the federal side is the entire band of 95 megahertz from 1755 to 1850. Uh, and there were a couple reasons for that. Uh, one was uh, that uh, some of the federal systems that operate in that band actually operate in the entire 95 megahertz. And so if you, if you say to the uh, agencies you need to get out of the lower 25, you're actually telling them to get out of all 95 because that's how the systems operate. Uh, secondly, was the, you know, the command was 500 megahertz, so why settle for 25 when you want to get to 95? Um, and third, uh, sort of the flip side of that is everyone suspected that the industry would come back for that upper 70 at some point anyway. So, so NTI uh, went down that road, uh, looked at all 95 megahertz, came back with uh, a report uh, informed by the work of the agencies that said uh, the agencies could substantially clear out of that band uh, at a cost of $18 billion. Uh, over 10 years uh, if there was comparable spectrum to relocate some of those systems to. Um, the industry said, well, that's, that's just perfect, uh, except uh, $18 billion is, is too much money, 10 years is too long, and we really don't think you need the comparable spectrum. But other than that, it was a really good roadmap that brought everyone together. Um, uh, so uh, uh, that then set uh, NTIA and the agencies onto a new path, which was to look at uh, more opportunities for sharing in that band um, with the idea that uh, with sharing you can save money because you don't have to spend so much to relocate. Uh, you might be able to accelerate uh, access because you, you don't have to wait for the relocation um, and you don't need the comparable spectrum. Um, so uh, that work has continued. Uh, I think that they made a lot of progress very early on and, and uh, it was very heartening uh, to hear from the industry uh, signs of the amount of collaboration that they were uh, enjoying and experiencing with the industry. Uh, I would say uh, as the CSMAC, the Commerce Spectrum Management Advisory Committee, uh, starts to uh, uh, wrap up that work, um, uh, things have probably slowed down a bit. Uh, and that is something I'm going to talk about a little bit more when I talk about our presidential memorandum because we've really learned some lessons in that, in that uh, exercise that, uh, that we're going to uh, learn from and, and now uh, uh, hope to solve. Uh, I should mention one other uh, initiative that the NTI took on, which was looking at uh, spectrum in the 5 gigahertz band, uh, about 195 megahertz of spectrum there. Uh, the FCC has now put out a notice of, uh, of proposed rulemaking to, to uh, repurpose that for, for uh, uh, largely unlicensed use. Um, in, in the midst of this, uh, uh, just to take it chronologically, the, the president in his 2011 State of the Union address announced uh, what we called our National Wireless Initiative, and the basic goal there was uh, to make sure that 98% of Americans would have access to 4G wireless uh, by, by 2016, and thanks to the efforts of the major carriers uh, and uh, I think some smart... Uh, a uh, smart policy on our part, we're, uh, we're, we're sure to hit that, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm told. Um, one of the things that, you know, you don't hear about much in terms of uh, policy, it, it, 
you, you hear about spectrum policy, you hear about what the FCC is doing. Um, uh, in 2011, uh, we worked with Congress to uh, uh, enact uh, a, a uh, amendment to the tax code that allowed for accelerated depreciation of capital investment. And I think if you talk to the carriers, you'll hear that that uh, was a big boon for them. Uh, it, it allowed them to uh, accelerate their deployment uh, and get us uh, to where we are today. Um, later in 2011, the President proposed the American Jobs Act. Uh, which uh, had an array of spectrum-related provisions, which uh, uh, were uh, in the main enacted uh, last year in the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012. Probably the big highlight there, the incentive auctions that we've heard a little bit about uh, today. Uh, also preserving uh, FCC authority to uh, allocate some of that for unlicensed use in the guard bands. Uh, and also the, uh, uh, the uh, creation of FirstNet, the First Responders Network Authority, which you'll be a nationwide uh, interoperable network for our nation's first responders. Um, uh, a, 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 uh, a real need there. It's been uh, uh, way too long. Um, I, you know, this was the need for this, for a real interoperability between public, public uh, safety agencies was brought home on 9-11 when the police and the fire uh, teams couldn't speak to each other up in uh, New York. Uh, we saw it in Katrina in New Orleans when the rescue teams from out of state uh, had had trouble uh, communicating uh, to to rescue the folks down there. Um, it's it's a it's a huge challenge. Uh, you know these these uh, public safety agencies growing up over the the course of the 20th century, uh, all kind of investing in their own uh, uh, systems and 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 services. Getting them all to work together uh, has been a huge challenge for years. Um, we're we're still. Getting FirstNet up and going, um, we brought a great team in there. Um, we're, we've gotten them the spectrum. We're going to get them the funding. Uh, I'm, I'm very encouraged by what's, uh, what we're going to see there. Uh, and there's, there's um, a, 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 not just an opportunity, but a real need for partnering, not only with the states and the local uh, governments, but also with uh, the private sector, because the $7 billion, which FirstNet can ultimately uh, get, is not uh, going to be nearly enough. And so partnering with the uh, with the uh, commercial side is, is essential. And, and I'm hoping the way this turns out is given that, that FirstNet has both spectrum and dollars to offer and, and the private side has infrastructure and spectrum of their own to offer that we can marry this up in a way that actually, among other things, expands uh, wireless access for consumers in rural areas in particular. The statute requires FirstNet to build out in rural areas um, and that might be an interesting opportunity to leverage uh, that requirement along with that funding uh, with the commercial side because the needs of public safety presumably will be a little less uh, on a day-to-day -day basis out in rural areas, uh, perhaps uh, creating an opportunity for uh, greater uh, uh, service to consumers out there. Uh, I know that's some, there's lots of complications to that, uh, but it's something they're considering and it's uh, one of the potential great side benefits uh, of FirstNet. Um, the FCC, of course, has been hard at work. I've mentioned a couple of the things, the, uh, the, the 5 gigahertz, the 3.5 gigahertz, uh, the incentive auctions, uh, uh, updating the rules on the WCS and AWS 4 spectrum to make that uh, available for mobile broadband. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of work going on. Um, uh, this stuff takes time. It's hard work. I know um, over at NTIA where, where they've uh, got these working groups working at the uh, uh, on the 1755 band, uh, e even folks on industry, uh, you know, everybody's very excited at the beginning uh, as it became a tougher slog and harder work. Uh, I know uh, I, I get calls occasionally from people saying, oh my God, I've got to go to another one of those meetings. Uh, but, uh, but, but this is hard work. Uh, and uh, 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 one of the things we're trying to do with this memorandum that I'm about to talk about is to make sure we're we're bringing the best minds to this together in a collaborative way and making sure we're sharing information, particularly government information, with the private sector. Because uh, that's been the big lesson we've learned there um, is uh, it's, it's reinventing the wheel every time for the agencies, uh, whether it's in these working groups, uh, whether it's um, uh, there was uh, the industry uh, applied and got a, a special temporary authority permission from the commission to do some monitoring with the agencies, with DOD. In particular, um, uh, you know, when Light Squared came up a few years ago, we all had to kind of uh, scrum around that and, and figure out how to do it. It's, it's a sort of an ad hoc process, and that's really what we're trying to solve with this memorandum, is to make sure that 
uh, this work is only going to grow and get, get harder, and we need to make sure that we're collaborating as efficiently as possible. Um, one other uh, uh, item I should mention before I turn to the memorandum, and that is uh, the PCAS, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, uh, came out with their report uh, last summer. Uh, very big emphasis on spectrum sharing. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of innovative thinking, a lot of groundbreaking work there. Um, I think the you know it's interesting the debate uh, often uh, boils down to this sort of simplistic view of sharing versus clearing, um, and you know spectrum is finite. So you know if if you if if you have exclusive allocations to different companies and different institutions, you're still sharing spectrum. So we, we, we'll always have sharing. We're always going to have sharing. Uh, at the same time, there are situations where uh, clearing of federal systems out of certain bands just makes sense. Uh, it really comes down to the dollars. Uh, can we raise enough money at an auction to pay for the, for the relocation? That's how the statute works. That's what we're required to do. Um, and when that makes sense, that's what we should do. Um, and so this debate about clearing or sharing as if they are binary decisions, I, I find a little distracting. Um, uh, we have very much embraced uh, the, the, the all of the above approach, uh, and that comes to uh, licensed versus, uh, versus unlicensed. Uh, as Blair was saying, Wi-Fi and other unlicensed applications have just been unbelievable. Uh, again, something that, that nobody saw coming 20 years ago. Uh, but it's not just Wi-Fi, of course. It's, it's in uh, industry, it's in medicine, it's in uh, uh, transportation. Um, so we're, we're pushing all of these efforts, and it goes back to what I said at the beginning. Um, I, I very much view our, our role as uh, not, not being the uh, creators of the next big app or the next great service, but of, of supplying uh, the raw materials uh, to the private sector uh, and to the FCC, and, and you know, we, we will engage in the FCC as appropriate as they do rulemakings and try to figure out what the right allocations are. But the first step, the building block, is, um, is making sure the government is being as efficient as possible in its use of spectrum uh, so, that, uh, so that all that great innovation can flourish. Uh, so, um, so this morning we've, we've issued a, a memorandum on spectrum, um, uh, and as I said, it's, it's really based on a lot of feedback we've gotten from the agencies and from the industry uh, out of the, the process that NTI has been leading uh, in looking at uh, the 1755 ban. So let me just walk you through a few things in it. Um, I, I was nervous. I think they were um, releasing it at around 9.30 or 10 this morning, meaning, meaning right about now, and I was fully expecting to be here and, and to see a bunch of your heads here as you were all reading it on, the, on whatever devices you brought with you. Um, but uh, but uh, let me just walk you through a few things. Um, one of the things we're going to be doing is creating a spectrum policy team. Uh, that is going to be uh, a White House-based team uh, to oversee implementation of the memorandum, uh, as well as to support the work of NTIA and the agencies. Uh, the co-chairs of the team will be uh, Todd Park, the U.S. Chief Technology Officer, and Gene Sperling, the Director of the National Economic Council. Those aren't lifetime appointments. It goes with the, uh, goes with the office, not with the person, but that's who's sitting in the office today. Um, and then other members of that team will be uh, the Office of Management and Budget, uh, the Council of Economic Advisors, and the National Security Staff. Um, one of the first things uh, that the memorandum talks about is the ongoing process that NTIA and the, and the CSMAC have been overseeing, uh, and it, it endorses that as the right approach. Uh, we need to do it more and we need to do it better, so the memorandum will direct uh, the, the Commerce Department to expand that approach to other bands, uh, but also to get better at it. And this, this is, I, I would say, one of the mainstays of this memorandum. Um, it directs uh, NIST and NTIA and the other agencies to come up with uh, practices and policies that will enable better sharing of information. Uh, th this, is, this is the sort of the, the roadblock we've run into, is the agency's trying to figure out how to draw on uh, the expertise of the private sector without disclosing uh, too much information and making sure it's kept in a classified way. It's interesting, this, this kind of sharing of confidential information goes on all the time between the, the government and the private sector, uh, and in some contexts it is decades old. In this context, uh, it is new, and, and I can tell you from talking to folks uh, uh, at the agencies that it, it, is, it is the development of those relationships and the development of trust uh, within the, the key uh, offices within the 
the Defense Department or the other agencies and their counterparts on the private side um, that, that just has not existed over time. This is new for a lot of us. And so we need to develop the practices and the policies, templates, non-disclosure agreements, uh, whatever it takes, we need to stop reinventing that every time we sort of jump into this debate because the debate's not going away, the discussion's not going away, it's just getting more complex. And so, you know, overall the, the memorandum attacks this. Uh, this is kind of weedy stuff, you know. I would love to have, have a memorandum that said, um, you know, we're, we can declare victory now. We've got, uh, you know, thousands of megahertz to, to offer to the commercial side and thousands for license and thousands for unlicensed and thousands for the government and everybody's happy, but, but we're not there yet. We need to get there and that's what the memorandum is set up to do. Um, NIST and NTIA are also going to be charged with uh, uh, publishing an inventory of spectrum uh, R&D facilities, uh, federal facilities that are capable of spectrum R&D, and again, encouraging collaboration between the government and the private sector uh, to look at uh, spectrum sharing, uh, other advanced communications um, uh, in a way that, that uh, can advance the interests of, of the commercial side and the American consumer when you come down to it, while protecting uh, the interest of the federal agencies that are operating uh, in the affected bands. Um, we're going to, uh, the memorandum is going to uh, put new requirements on uh, the agencies when it comes to reporting on their actual uses of spectrum. Um, so you might know that uh, an agency with a spectrum assignment has to renew that assignment essentially every five years by filing with uh, NTIA. As part of that, we're going to require them to be uh, more specific in a quantitative assessment of how they actually use that spectrum. Uh, again, it's sort of filling in uh, some of the knowledge gaps uh, that we have today uh, and then be able to figure out based on what we learn, where are the opportunities for clearing or for sharing of that federal spectrum with the commercial side. That process uh, will take five years to fully implement because the, the, the renewal or the re-upping of, of a federal assignment uh, is done every five years. So we're, we're, we don't want to uh, wait the full five years for all of that. So NTIA and the Spectrum Policy Team will actually be uh, empowered to take specific bands and get from the agencies that quantitative assessment on an even faster basis. So if we look at specific bands and decide that's where we need to make some more progress and that's where we need to understand more about what the federal uh, usage looks like, we'll be able to accelerate uh, the reporting in those bands um, uh, ahead of what would otherwise be the, the five years. Um, uh, we're going to uh, impose uh, some requirements on agencies when it comes to uh, requesting a frequency assignment or a, or a spectrum certification for, for systems operating, uh, particularly below six gigahertz, where they will have to verify that in seeking the assignment or in seeking the certification that they are uh, occupying the minimum spectrum uh, necessary. And uh, particularly in the case of the certification requests, uh, they're going to have to explain why, why their approach makes the most sense from a uh, spectrum efficiency perspective. That doesn't mean that spectrum efficiency is dispositive. Uh, there are other concerns, budget concerns, you know, uh, uh, buying the most spectrum efficient uh, uh, gear, like buying the best radio or the best stereo costs more money. Uh, and we get that, uh, and, and agencies will, will, of course, have to take that into account. Uh, same with just the overall agency mission. Um, it has to be taken into account. But today, uh, this doesn't happen, and uh, uh, agencies, uh, you know, request assignments. Uh, they have to worry about budget. They have to worry about mission, but they don't have to sort of show their homework when it comes to uh, spectrum efficiency. And so that's what uh, we're going to uh, uh, address there and also in... Um, in uh, procurements, uh, and we'll be NTIA will be working with OMB to uh, to make sure that uh, efficiency uh, uh, is is built into procurement guidelines. And again, it, it com does come back to this cost issue. One of the things we'll want agencies to do when they're buying new systems is to is to look at systems that are more flexible, that would be capable of being retuned to not just the band that they're designed to operate in initially but able to operate in other bands as well so that we can have flexibility going down the, the path. But it does raise this challenge because that's going to be a more expensive system. So, uh, but, but, but today there's no requirement that agencies think about these things. A lot of them are thinking about these things, but there's no requirement that they do. And so we think that's an important step forward. Um, 
we're directing uh, NTIA to uh, 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 set up a pilot program to do monitoring uh, of spectrum in real time uh, in communities throughout the country. Now, this is going to be subject to a budget request in our FY14 uh, budget. Uh, it's a small program. It's $7.5 million. Uh, but the goal would be to see whether that kind of monitoring uh, could uh, provide better data on what federal spectrum usage looks like uh, and, and suggest whether a more comprehensive approach, uh, a nationwide approach to that, could be an important tool. These programs go on today um, out at uh, the labs at NTIA in Boulder. They have some uh, facility for this. Uh, Professor Roberson in, in Chicago uh, is engaged in this. And you know, there's anecdotal evidence that I think we're all familiar with that uh, we see federal assignments where it doesn't look like there's a lot of usage going on. Uh, that's the kind of thing we want to we want to dig into. To be fair to the agencies, they will tell you in some cases that the fact that you don't see usage as uh, frequently as you might think doesn't mean that they don't need it. Uh, and you know, as one example, uh, there are obviously federal uh, uses of spectrum that require just listening uh, for for uh, other uses by uh, potential bad actors, uh, for example. And the fact that you're not hearing anything is is a good thing, uh, but it also means we we need to keep listening. And so, uh, uh, you know, digging into those need those kinds of needs as well as the other needs of the agencies where they're actually transmitting in the band. Um, and understanding how we might uh, do that more efficiently and make more available for the commercial side uh, is a big piece of what we're doing. Um, uh, we, we're uh, we're going to have some uh, requests to the FCC. Uh, one of the things we would like them to look at is uh, performance criteria for uh, receivers. Uh, the uh, uh, situation where receivers are designed to operate in one band, but they essentially start listening into other bands, and then the licensees in those other bands are, are uh, feel constricted in their use. Uh, uh, we're not calling for for regulation of of uh, receivers, um, but we would like the FCC to consider how, uh, uh, perhaps, in the development of voluntary standards uh, uh, and and efforts like that, uh, we could make sure that uh, receivers are designed as efficiently as as can be. Um, We'll also just be looking for the FCC to continue their their work uh, in a lot of complementary ways. Um, the president's initial memorandum asking for uh, 500 megahertz that was a, a joint effort between NTI and FCC for repurposing both federal as well as non-federal spectrum to wireless broadband. So we want them obviously to keep working on that. Uh, there will certainly be cases where uh, the federal agencies will be clearing systems out of existing bands. They'll need, they will need comparable spectrum. And where that exists, we'll, of course, need the FCC to, to help us on that. Um, uh, we want them to consider uh, uh, making sure that spectrum is being built out, uh, whether that's uh, specific build-out requirements or other, other incentives uh, to make sure that spectrum is being put to good use, uh, and to continue to promote a good market for uh, a good secondary market uh, for spectrum. Uh, is also uh, important. Um, beyond that, uh, just a couple more things. The Spectrum uh, policy team will be tasked with doing a couple reports uh, and make recommendations back to the president. Uh, one is on incentives for agencies. Uh, those of you who go to Spectrum conferences, uh, we hear about incentives all the time. Uh, uh, it is, um, it's a, it's a real challenge. The PCAST looked at this. They they came up with something they called spectrum currency, which we'll, we'll, we, we're going to task the spectrum policy team to look at specifically. The idea is, is essentially that as uh, uh, agencies relinquish spectrum, they would develop credits in this sort of shadow spectrum currency, which could then later be uh, cashed in against the spectrum relocation fund or something like the spectrum relocation fund, which is funded through auction proceeds. Um, uh, it's 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 you know it's a big difference on the on the private sector. You you say to the CEO or say to the head of the you know division, here's here's where we want to be by the end of the year, and you get 10 percent, or you get this big uh, you get this big bonus either for you personally or for your division. Uh, the government just doesn't operate that way. We don't pay huge bonuses, uh, um, and we don't uh, you know we don't have like a bottom line. We don't have distributions to shareholders. Uh, um, we just, they think about things just completely differently. Uh, 
uh, I'm not saying anything that uh, isn't isn't painfully obvious, but it's uh, it, it's really striking how different the, the the mindset is. It's not that uh, the folks in the government who are working on this stuff are uh, uh, have uh, any less ability or or desire, uh, but the fact is that incentives <laughs> really do work. I, I think one of the challenges here, frankly, is is the budget process because if if you do figure out a way that says the agency that, that relinquishes spectrum will be entitled to some some benefit, some uh, some uh, supplement to their budget. You're going to run into this problem that that the the budgeters on the Hill or at OMB even will say, "Oh, that that hundred million dollar asset you wanted, you know, great. We don't have to give you the money because you just paid for it yourself." So it just sort of uh, is a wash, right? Um, so, uh, but but it, it comes up so often. Um, and it seems like there should be a solution there. We, we do not have that answer. Uh, this is not like uh, uh, we're not writing the report because we already know the answer. Um, uh, we do want to uh, get the best minds on that and see if we can develop uh, the best answer. The other uh, report uh, we're going to put out, uh, which we'll be doing a year, would be simply a, a, a look at how NTIA and the FCC are incorporating spectrum sharing into their uh, policies uh, going forward. Uh, and particularly a look at licensed versus unlicensed and uh, and how that is uh, uh, progressing. We're, we're, the administration, as I said earlier, has been uh, big fans. We, we did uh, uh, work to make sure that the legislation that was passed last year did preserve uh, some authority for the FCC to continue to allocate spectrum to unlicensed because of the benefits in, in, uh, that we've seen in, in uh, unlicensed services. So. Um, that is uh, that is kind of it in a nutshell. I know I kind of ran through that fast. Um, I will mention a couple other things um, that are also going on today. We're going to be announcing $100 million in uh, funding for uh, spectrum sharing and advanced communications research. Um, the good news is the, the lion's share of that is already appropriated. Uh, DARPA uh, has a program called uh, SPARC. Uh, the I didn't bring my notes up. Uh, it's SSPARC. Do you know, Tom? Sorry. Uh, uh, so it's actually Spark because there are two S's at the beginning. Um, but it's it's spectrum it's spectrum sharing uh, and particularly between radar and communications. Um, and uh, they kicked off this program earlier this year. It goes over five years, but it's going to be a total of sixty million dollars uh, uh, in grants. Uh, the National Science Foundation has their years program, uh, expanding access to the radio spectrum. They're going to award $23 million in grants uh, before the end of this fiscal year, so that's before the end of September. And then I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, NTIA, we proposed $7.5 million to do that spectrum monitoring uh, system. Uh, and then uh, uh, at NIST, we've uh, proposed a $10 million uh, line item in their FY14 budget. Uh, this well, ties into the work I mentioned earlier, where NIST and NTIA would be working together to uh, advance uh, collaboration between the private and public sector. Uh, they're going to have a separate announcement, actually. Uh, NIST and NTIA are establishing something they're calling the Center for Advanced Communications. It's uh, it's uh, putting the resources of, of NIST and NTIA together out in Boulder uh, to uh, to to collaborate with each other and also to invite more private sector uh, engagement and, and commercialization of the uh, of the outcome of their research. Uh, we're also, uh, 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 NIST and NTIA are going to be uh, hosting a little later this summer a technology day to showcase some of the advanced wireless uh, technologies that, uh, that we're all uh, uh, helping to bring about. And then uh, finally, uh, uh, on a related note, uh, today the Office of Science and Technology Policy and the National Economic Council are releasing a report called Four Years of Broadband Growth. And it's really uh, kind of a look back at some of the successes we've had over the four years, the great growth in uh, deployment, in adoption, um, uh, but also looking at some of the challenges. Um, uh, in 2012, we got over the 70% mark for home broadband adoption, which is great to have gotten over that mark, but it still means 30% of households uh, are not subscribing. And uh, so it just looks at uh, the reasons given for that. And, you know, it's interesting that one of uh, uh, usually the biggest reason given is a lack of interest or a lack of relevance, people who don't think broadband is relevant to their lives. And, uh, you know, just incredible. I remember it was Blair who 
told me a couple years ago the, the data point about Fortune 500 companies who, if you want to apply for a job, you've got to do it online. Uh, and I'm just imagining that among those who um, think that, that the Internet's not relevant to their lives are people uh, who uh, might be looking for a job. And uh, so uh, a lot of our role is to, uh, to advance that. We've uh, advanced understanding and digital literacy skills. Um, uh, we've uh, funded some of that in the Recovery Act. I know um, we've seen other efforts, uh, certainly on the cable side, um, Comcast and uh, with their Internet Essentials program, uh, I was I'm told that they have uh, they have reached I think it's 160,000 uh, households and 600,000 uh, folks in those households with their um, low cost broadband to the homes, which is just fantastic. Um, and of course, we're also taking on uh, this issue in the president's uh, call last week for modernization of the E-rate program at the FCC uh, to bring. Uh, uh, bigger and faster broadband pipes into schools and and uh, greater distribution and, uh, via Wi-Fi in particular uh, within the schools. Um, well, we've had a busy couple weeks. Uh, um, I'm going to uh, uh, take a breath for about a minute to celebrate the release of the uh, memorandum, uh, but you can be asking questions during that minute. I'll be celebrating. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, that's... that's uh, that's uh, where we are. Um, it's as I said at the beginning. We are. It's it's so exciting to be in the middle of this stuff. Uh, I'm really glad that I'm not the one who has to figure out all the great stuff that goes on with Spectrum. I'm really glad that uh, so many folks like those of you of you in this room are the ones doing that stuff. It, it is we're delivering so much to the American uh, people, whether it's education or or healthcare or transportation or manufacturing or inventory control. Uh, we're seeing it all over the place. Uh, I know there's there's better things to come. There's a lot of hard work ahead of us, uh, and that's really what we're trying to um, make a little easier in the purpose of or in the release of this uh, memorandum. So with that, I will uh, stop and be happy to take uh, any questions. And I'm shocked to see that Paul Kirby, the journalist, has a question. I'm going to shock you, Tom. Um, I've only had the memo for like three minutes, so let me ask you. Um, What's to stop an agency from just saying that? I know the, the trusted agent concept is something that the, the agencies and industry have looked at, but what's to stop an agency, the memo and understanding, to say this is classified and you know we're not going to share this with industry, God knows, and which is one of the problems. And so I guess I'm curious um, if there's any way around that. Um. Well, it, you know, it's a challenge. There's no, there's no silver bullet there, uh, and they have legitimate concerns. I know uh, sometimes those concerns and those assertions uh, are met with skepticism, skepticism on the, on the uh, private side. Um, I, I, you know, we're, we're, uh, th you know, this is a signal that that we certainly understand the, the, the tension there, and uh, you know, we're gonna, we've got a spectrum policy team. Uh, that's going to be one of their main focuses. Uh, it, it, you know, it has the economic folks, it has the science and technology side, it has the national security staff there. Um, I, I, I don't have the, 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 the perfect answer to that, but uh, clearly that is one of the issues we've, we've run into. We need to protect uh, sensitive information and sensitive systems, but we also need to figure out a way to share it. It has worked in other, in other areas. I mean, if you look back over the history of, of you know, uh, AT&T's work with the government going back decades and decades, uh, a lot of sensitive information was shared. It's just sort of new in this area. So, um, uh, you know, that's, that's where we're going to be focusing a lot of our attention. It's a blogger, not a commercial publisher, but uh, there are two third rails in federal spectrum management that you might want to think about. I don't want to put you on the spot, but make, make sure you're aware of them. In the spectrum measurement area, NTA for 40 years has been very, very careful never to measure 225 to 400 megahertz. They've measured just below 225. They've measured just above 400. But apparently it would be embarrassing to the military to measure what the occupancy of 225 to 400 is in urban areas. It's used, but not in urban areas. Uh, I hope when you, look at the, when you look at that spectrum measurement program that you indicate displeasure to NTIA if they continue to avoid 225 to 400. And the second issue is, while it's easy for NTIA to point their finger at FCC about receiver standards, NTIA has tolerated for 20 years FAA's unwillingness to implement an ICAO standard on instrument landing system receivers. 
uh, that is a treaty obligation of the United States and which has tremendous impact on the FM broadcasting community, even though that's not the people here. Uh, so rather than the federal government pointing their fingers at FCC, which is well deserved, I hope that the federal government will look internally and ask some serious questions about why the ICAO receiver standard, which is a standard that's in place for 20 years, has never been implemented. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, first off, kudos to you guys for, for actually having the president come out and say we need to move this forward. That's, it's great leadership. The problem is, is that despite all the best intentions, it's the same sort of principle when the, the president says, I order agencies to conduct a regulatory review and re remove regulations that are, you know, have outlived its usefulness. The problem we've been having with government spectrum is the agency looks at it and goes, nope, still need it. So we've been struggling for years, years, to develop a mechanism whereby we can get the government to act more efficiently, yet even the last, you know, the recent PCAST report, we can see that we're not inefficient, we're still acting inefficiently. As I haven't had a chance to look at the memo, I mean, is there anything in, in your new approach that we're sort of moving to a direction of going, okay, we're going to make some hard decisions and carve out the government spectrum, I mean, or is there still just a lot of work to be done in that area? How do we f just get the agencies to go, we have to make a decision, move forward? You know, there, the, uh, there is a lot of hard work, and there are so many moving parts here. Um, uh, you know, people have said to me before on the, from the private side, you know, well, you're in the White House, just tell them. And it's, it's, it's like what you said, well, okay, I'll tell them. <laughs> now we got to do it, <laughs> right? And, uh, and, you know, uh, and in their defense, you know, w w the, the, you know, DOD says, well, we want to move up to the 2125 band, and the license carriers say, no, 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 not there. And they go, okay, well, we'll go up to five gigahertz, and, and you've got other stuff going on there. You can't go there. And it reminds me of, you know, closing time at the bar when the bartender says, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. I know none of you know what closing time at a bar is like, but... <laughs> um, uh, so they, they do have those, those challenges, and it's hard work. And when, when uh, you know, when you're uh, in the room with the person who's running the air combat training system or the telemetry system who says, you know, we, we can't do this without sub substantial risk or comparable spectrum or a lot of money, um, you know, we have people in the agencies whose job it is to do this stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, your point and it sort of echoed something Blair said, there, there is a tendency in the government to keep doing things the old way, uh, because they have, that's their incentive, is to, to protect those things. So I, you know, there, there's, there's um, the, the, you know, as with uh, the previous question, there's not a, there's not a silver bullet on this. Um, I, I, I appreciate your comment at the beginning. I, I wish I had a, a uh, the perfect solution in, in response to the, the other, other than, you know, this is, this is, um, uh, it is changing cultures, and, and I can tell you, that, you know, if you talk to the senior folks at the agencies, including the Defense Department, they are totally on board. But you know, if if you're the uh, at the leadership positions in the Defense Department, you know, you've got thousands of people running thousands of systems. Um, we just have to keep sending the message and uh, and and just keep making progress incrementally. It has to do with PCAST. Um, you, what happened to some of the other PCAST recommendations? Um, aren't you considering setting up some kind of industry-based exploration of the new technologies you need to help make these administrative tasks that the policy, Spectrum Policy team is putting in place? I mean, you're trying to make it easier to figure out how the federal government uses Spectrum in order to find efficiencies there. but. The P PCAST also recommended advancing technology, and, and truthfully, your 100 million of grants, all of that stuff has been around for a while, including the DARPA radar thing. These are not new initiatives. Uh, they are just, you know, documenting that you have initiatives that could be built on, but where is the team that's going to build on this to actually put the new technologies out there? I don't see that being answered, and of course, I haven't read the memo either. Thank you. Well, if I understand the question, I mean, it goes back to what I think I've said a couple times, which is I, I don't, um, you know, I don't think the government needs to be developing uh, uh, 
uh, to be leading the development of apps or de leading the development of new technologies, we have a role to play, and I think grant programs are a role to play. I think opening up Spectrum R&D facilities is the way to do it. Uh, I think making sure we're sharing government data so that the private side can uh, can help us learn better how to use our spectrum more efficiently uh, and how they can work around it better in a shared context. But I, I don't, I, don't uh, I mean, and that, that's the things the memo does uh, seek to accomplish. Um, you know, the PCAST talked uh, about uh, smaller cells. You know, absolutely. I was talking to somebody um, involved in the Sprint SoftBank transaction who said to me that Sprint has 40,000 access points in the U.S. SoftBank has... 200,000 in Japan, and it's, you know, one-fifth uh, uh, or one-twentieth the land mass, so basically 100 times uh, the ratio of cells for, to, to land mass. Definitely, uh, that's got to be a part of the future. You look at what uh, uh, Comcast and some of the cable companies are doing with Wi-Fi. Um, I, 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 I live about a mile from the White House, and uh, I can almost get home on on Wi-Fi, what, what to me is free Wi-Fi hotspots on the way home because I'm a Comcast subscriber at home. Uh, I, you know, I think we're seeing all these developments, but but and it's great, and we need to see more of it. Uh, and the government, you know, has a role to play in in uh, facilitating that. But I, I I really think you know the private sector uh, is where it comes from, and and part of it, it's true that. Um, uh, we have to send signals, I think, of, of where we think things are going. But we, you know, we gotta we gotta kind of have a light touch on it because because it's the private sector that, that solves these things in the long run. I think. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, John, I'm glad you asked. Um, thanks for that question. So uh, I, went, uh, uh, I went to a wedding last week, uh, last weekend. Uh, two antennas got married. Um, the ceremony was nice, but the reception was perfect. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thank you very much, Tom. That was, that was delightful and informative. Uh, I think we are at a stage now where we are going to take a short coffee break. We'll reconvene. Coffee's over here to your left uh, with other refreshments. Uh, just as a practical matter, restrooms are directly behind you. Please make yourselves welcome. <laughs>